Welcome to the Dynamic Leaders Podcast, the show that talks culture and leadership in sports with some of the most compelling coaches, athletes, and business people in the world. I am your host, Colin Cernelia, and thank you for joining us today. Be sure to check out the show notes for any additional information you want to know about this episode, and you can also find my contact information if you'd like to say hi. If you aren't driving or in the middle of a run, please consider taking a minute and leaving us a review of the show on Apple Podcasts. This is the best way to help other folks find the show. And if you're feeling extra generous, hit share on this episode and post it to your social media handles. Thank you, as always, for all of the support. Don't forget, if you haven't already, to check out my Amazon best-selling book, Culture of Excellence, What We Can Learn from the Yankees About Leadership. This book is a fun and informative read that is filled with impactful stories that will become value adds to your life. I'm a little biased, but seriously, it's a transformative book. You can find that, training notebooks, swag, and information on the Leadership Academy workshop and trainings all in the show notes or go to talent409.com. Okay, I am here today with MJ Knighton. MJ is the head coach at the University of San Diego for the softball program, a former collegiate softball player at Nebraska as well. MJ, I want to start today's conversation when I was doing a little bit of research. Actually, it was the first time I came across anything that you had done before, and this is the reason that I reached out to you. I saw the phrase, program building leadership abilities. <laughs> that just stood out to me more than anything else that I have here in my research. I was like, whoa, program building leadership abilities. This woman must be something special. Can we talk a little bit about where that phrase came from? Why people decided to, you know, for lack of a better word, label you as that? Man, I didn't even know I was labeled like that. Uh, but <laughs> I, I I can kind of see why. I mean, I'm a very big people person. I love getting to know people and connecting with them and kind of putting myself in their shoes. Um, so when I got this new role, um, it was different kind of navigate that because I have that head coach title now. And so people are kind of afraid of me now. And I'm not an assistant coach. <laughs> right. uh, so, but I felt like because I am very approachable, very fun, and I want to keep everything lighthearted at the same time, challenging them and putting them in situations that's not comfortable. I can see where that comes into play. Um, I know it's been very hard right now because we can't have a lot of team bonding activities in person because of COVID. Um, but we've done a lot of kind of family feud, uh, a lot of, you know, diversity conversations on Zoom. And we've done a lot of, you know, watching John Gordon podcasts on the team on Zoom and really just working together and figure out how can we still be able to build and build a program that's going to be elite in the future um, through Zoom and through, you know, social distancing the best way that we can. It's been a challenge, but it's been good at the same time. We did a lot of cooking shows and things on Zoom. So a lot of good things to still get the team camaraderie together at the same time, softball as well. We're working to get that much stronger mentally and physically. Yeah, so I think it's awesome that you've you know really taken to the the necessary change. I mean, we didn't really have a choice, especially there in the beginning when we were literally on lockdown. Uh, you had to figure out a way to communicate and everything. And I know there's some coaches out there that are still a little resistant to to the change in the technology. And um, how like how many times maybe per week or per month are you trying to get together via Zoom? Because I know one of the issues that I encounter all the time with people that I'm chatting about or chatting with is they're just zoomed out they <laughs> everything they do is is zoom so you know i imagine to some extent the girls end up getting zoomed out as well and even yourself and your coaching staff like you, there's only so much you can do so how often are you trying to you know whether it's a cooking thing whether it's a family feud whether whatever it is that you're doing how often are you trying to get them like within a, a month uh, worth of time yeah so when this all first started over the summer we met once a week um, we met with our returning class um, once every Wednesday, Tuesday, and then we met with our freshman incoming once a week as well at night. Um, and then once we started kind of getting into the fall situations, there were still only 10 of them here that can be in person with us and the rest were still at home. 
So we still met with those people that were back at home for at least two or three times a week via Zoom. And then we did one big one team Zoom every weekend. Um, and they, they were zoomed out and you can kind of see that eyes kind of glaze over sometimes <laughs> on zoom and, uh, which I understood because I, I guess I'm a people person. So that whole kind of zoom thing was not my cup of tea, but, uh, that's why I incorporated the cooking stuff and all those different type of activities to get some personality out of them instead of just having them stare at the screen for 30 to 45 minutes at a time. But, uh, so we did that a lot, but now that we're in full season and we got to practice a good amount in the first month in January. January. Uh, it's been a lot of in-person interaction. I think that's what they needed. Um, so we've been doing a lot more social distance activities at our field. We have a big field, so we use that to our advantage. Um, so not that many Zoom meetings as of right now, um, but definitely a lot in the summer and then fall for sure. But uh, I'm glad that we're just in, slowly getting back to in-person. That's sure, sure. And, and now that you're you know, like you said, slowly getting back to that, that normalcy, if you will. I mean, do you feel like it was worth it to go through some of those zoom pains and, and those different things? Like, do you think it made the impact that you were hoping it did leading up to this point? Oh, most definitely. And I think definitely for our freshman class, because we have a big freshman class. Um, and that's the whole purpose of over the summer meeting with just the freshman class for them to get to know me on a different level and my assistants on a different level as well. Um, so that way, as soon as they got on campus, that kind of in breaking that wall was already done um, via Zoom. And so we did a lot of that. And I think it was nice for that class as well to get to know each other. We didn't do a lot of surface level. We went deep to get to know somebody and get to know their relationships and their connections and different things like that. But it was definitely beneficial. And then we brought the incoming and the returners together, which was awesome. Um, so I loved it. Yeah. I, and um, again, I just love the attitude. Obviously, I'm sure you wish it was you weren't doing it this way. And, and, and actually, that leads me to my next question. So your first season as head coach was supposed to be the, the 2020 season, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how like how long did it take? Yeah, you, know, you get you get into the beginning of the season as far as games go and then things get start getting shut down. I mean, how long did it take for you? Like, I'm sure you had all these plans in your head. You're like, okay, I've been waiting for this moment, you know, for ever since I stopped playing. I finally got it. Here's my five year plan. Oh crap, I have to change everything. <laughs> like, what were some of the first things that you had to do to adapt uh besides uh, the Zoom calls, obviously? Um, I think my first thing was just honestly organization. In all honesty, um, uh, organizing my life, organizing what's going on, because it was kind of like I got a standstill. It felt like I just felt like I was stuck. Uh, so I was trying to organize and get myself back in that mindset of okay, like we there's something for it, there's something to look forward to. Um, because it just felt like, I don't know, everything got kind of swept under our feet and like, we had no idea how to adapt to that. And I think for me, it was just organizing and putting myself back in that place of like, some things coming at the end of this tunnel, whatever that let me look like, or whatever that may seem. Um, I have to keep kind of reminding myself, Hey, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Um, and so, yeah, that was my thing. It's just keeping myself present and not looking so kind of distraught, I guess you can say, because the season was cut and all those different types of things were happening. Um, so I just had to keep myself present and say, the, hey, the good's coming. The good is definitely coming. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Now, you are coaching after a super successful career, not just at the amateur level in college, but then also a professional career afterwards. I'm going to read off some stats just so people who are listening understand who we are talking to. But when you finished your career at Nebraska, you were ranked in the top 10 in 10 different categories. You were a four-time All Big Ten selection. You started 228 out of 229 games at third base and you had as a team three postseason appearances and one big 10 title in 2014 i say that as a way again to inform the listening audience who we're talking to here uh, but i also say it because what's really interesting is that it doesn't always equate in this way where like the best player on a team for example 
ends up becoming a head coach. And so I'd love to learn a little bit about the transition from your playing days to ultimately getting to this spot. Like, what did you have to learn? What are you doing differently? Obviously you're not playing. That's the biggest difference, but um, how did you go from, (laughs) you know, being uh, such a a great player, star player uh, to ultimately being a head coach, which requires, you know, many, many different, it's it's like the whole thing in the corporate world. A lot of times the high performers get promoted to a, a manager position, for example, and it just doesn't always end up working out because just because you're a high performer doesn't mean you can manage people that you can lead people. So uh, I would love to get at the crux of your transition and how you've ultimately gotten to this point. Yeah, honestly, I'm gonna be honest with you. I didn't see myself coaching my first two, three years in college. I wanted to become a news producer or a sports anchor, whatever that looked like. I wanted to be behind or in front of the camera. So that coaching was never in my mindset. And I think Coach Ravel did a great job of planting that seed because she did see those different type of capabilities and abilities that I had as a coach. I think mostly it's too because I'm very personable. Like I said, I'm very, I want to know somebody. I want to understand where they're coming from. And I think what's so nice is that because I'm personable and I know exactly what the girls are going through right now, not exactly in this moment because I'd never gone through a COVID shortened season (laughs) or anything like that, but I know what it they're going through when it comes to weights, when it comes to practice classes, all those different types of things. Um, but at the same time, it's like, I, I hold people accountable. I take care of the little things. I love taking care of the little things and they matter. Um, and I hold a high expectation for myself when I was a player and even now as a coach. And I think that's what kind of helped me into this role because I see potential in people and it's me holding them accountable. And I was like that as a player. Um, I never was really called the leader or the captain till my senior year, but I think because I just did things by example, I just led in that type of way that I really didn't need that title. And it's kind of that same way right now is that uh, Coach Revelle told me this, it's just a title change. It's really nothing. You still have to lead by example. You still have to be a sponge and learn. And I think that's the one thing that helped me throughout my whole career. And now coming to this point in my coaching career of being a sponge and learning and absorbing all these different things and being self-aware because, you know, we all don't arrive. We all want to get to that promised land and arrive, but we never really truly arrive. Yeah. Even in, as a person, you never do. So it's constantly putting that unnecessary pressure on myself is that, Hey, I never arrived. There's always something that I'm striving for. Uh, so that's kind of helped in this transition. And I think that's, what's nice of like, yeah, I was a good player. Uh, but you know, I can still be a great coach as well because I understand and I know how we can get to that point and, you know, keep growing as a program and as a coach and as a person. So. Yeah. And I love a lot of those reminders, especially that you, even if you think you've arrived, you've probably, you you haven't, like you said, you just haven't, like there's, there's always more uh, that you can be doing and growing and learning just such a great reminder. I'm curious, have you encountered now, whether it was when you were an assistant or as a head coach, just knowing what your playing career was like, have you ever encountered a player who was a little starstruck by your accomplishments and because of the fact that you are holding them to this high standard that you want them. Like I, I imagine like a scenario where, where someone who um, just thinks that they need to be you, right. They need to perform like you, like that's the high standard that you're setting, but I know that's not the case. So have you ever dealt with that uh, with any of uh, the players that you've had to coach? Um, I don't know, honestly, I've never seen it or I've never encountered it yet, probably in their minds, um, because I'm a third baseman. So I'm constantly always in our third baseman's ear because I just (laughs) love that position. And I just I don't want them to play it exactly how I played, but I want them to have that mentality of just like a vacuum. Hey, you're just taking everything that's in your way. Uh, So sometimes I can see them just kind of looking at me and I don't think they're really absorbing what I'm saying. I think they're just staring at me and like, oh, my gosh, I'm learning from, you know, a third baseman or whatever that may look like. But I think over time and now that it kind of broken that wall of like, hey, I'm your coach now, regardless of what my resume may have looked like, we're doing this together. And I think now they're like, okay, I'm here. Let's do this. What do I need to learn? What I need to do? Um, And I know definitely with uh, my sister, Shay, they definitely were very starstruck when she got here. Uh, (laughs) So they're definitely were more bigger eyes. But now they're slowly going like, hey, that's my coach and we're good. So definitely once that wall was broken down, we got in somewhere, which is good. Yeah. It's just bringing the, the human side to everything that just breaks that wall down. Like you said, I love it. <laughs> now, 
take me back a little bit. When did you realize that you had it, like that you could play obviously well enough in high school to get recruited by big time collegiate programs? Like, was there a moment that you remember where you're like, wow, I, I could take this pretty far if I work hard enough? Mm, I don't think there was a moment. I want to say, I think my dad always planted that seed in my head of, hey, you can go bigger. You can go bigger. You need to strive for better. Um, he never let us settle, never let us settle. I think that's the reason why my sister and I are at that point in our heads, the way we are, because we could never take a day off, never take a day <laughs> off. Even when we did, he was still having us take 50 dry swings in the mirror. Uh, <laughs> and so I think by having that constant motivation and constant kind of bird in our ear a little bit helped us get to that point, helped me especially get to where I needed to be as a player. So there really wasn't a defining moment. I think there was just my, my dad, my person just kind of kept keeping me in the loop and keeping me up to date. Like, Hey, like I said, you haven't arrived. And he constantly told us that. <laughs> and that's the <laughs> beauty about parents. They tell it like it is, but uh, I think that was very nice for him. So it was a defining person that kind of planted that seed for me. Sorry to interrupt, but I want to help you get fit. Christine here from Sweat With Sods. Being at home has a lot of people in a rut with their workouts, but you don't have to be. My HIT at home workouts require no equipment and can be done in 30 minutes or less. And if HIT isn't for you, I also design custom programs that can be done virtually, in person, or a combination of both. I put my years of experience teaching classes and personal training into all of my programs. I've worked with lots of people and helped them achieve very different goals. So what are you waiting for? Head to sweatwithstats.com today. And don't forget that as a listener to this podcast, you can get a discount with code DYNAMIC at checkout. Can't wait to hear from you. And now back to the show. Now I'm curious, you've talked a lot already about high performance, about having maybe higher expectations than most people. And then you say, never take a day off. How like, have you as a person avoided burnout in your career and how do you relay that again to your players to make sure that they don't burn out trying to accomplish everything that you're um, hoping that they do? Yeah. Yeah, man. Oh man. The burnout <laughs> it's real. And I, I did experience it one part in my senior year only because we weren't having the you know season that we anticipated on having. And I know I wasn't performing the way I anticipated before the season started. So there's definitely that burnout. Um, but I think it's constantly reminding that you're playing for something bigger than yourself. You're doing it for something bigger than yourself. Um, whether that is learning experiences throughout the whole thing to help you navigate life, or whether it's just in that moment of something that you're struggling with or whatever that may look like. Um, I think it's just constantly reminding that you're more than just MJ, the softball player. You're more than just whoever, the second baseman. You're more than that because yes, softball had played a big role in your life from the moment you touched the bat at probably five years old to now when you're 20 something years old, but it's only just a stepping stone to where you're trying to go as a person. And it's constantly reminding that, hey, I'm, I'm playing for something bigger and I'm more than just a softball player. There's something more in me. And this is just learning tools for me to be the person I wanna be once I cross the stage with my diploma in my hand. Um, so I, I get it. The burnout is really, it's easy to talk about that now, now that I'm kind of getting myself removed from the game as a player, uh, but it, it's just learning that and constantly telling yourself that over and over again and reassuring yourself that, hey, I'm good, I'm good. You know, the burnout, I feel it coming, but how, how can I combat that? What can I say to myself? What can I do? Do I go to a sports psych? Whatever that may look like. Um, I think that's what's hard about being an athlete. We forget that there are different resources available. We think that we have to just get it done right then and there. <laughs> uh, and, you know, hey, I'll figure this out on my own. But there's so many resources available to us. Um, and knowing that if you do reach that point, don't be afraid to go say, hey, I'm feeling this right now. And I did that my senior year and it helped me tremendously to finish strong the way I wanted to. Um, so it's constantly reminding yourself, Hey, I'm big, I'm bigger than this. Something's bigger for me coming. Hey, I'm good. And then there's resources out there to help me get through it. Yeah. I love that perspective. I'm not going to add anything to it because it was really, really great. I do want to talk a little bit about 
so more of the research that I was doing prior to this conversation and a few phrases popped up when I was doing research. And again, I would just love to get your thoughts and your feedback on these phrases. Um, the first is let's, let's start with uh, a plus work ethic. And, and again, we've talked about high performance a lot, uh, but a plus work ethic, what does that phrase mean to you? Man, what that means to me is constantly getting one step ahead of the game. It's constantly taking step forward. And I know like right now when everything was very fluid with scheduling games and figuring everything out, what the season may look like, I was like, there's still something that needs to be done. So I took one step ahead and did a whole COVID protocol for our, you know, complex in our stadium for different teams. So that way, you know, we're constantly working and kind of working with our facilities and different things like that. It's like, Hey, I still have stuff to do. Let me get one step ahead of that. So that way, if someone asked me for it, I already have it in hand and I don't have to hesitate and tell them, let me get back to you. No, I already have it. And it's constantly just being that head of the game like that. And I think that's what the beauty about, I think what softball has done for me, because you constantly have to think one step ahead of different <laughs> plays, like, hey, runner at one, hey, this, okay. But if this play doesn't happen, I'm gonna go three. It's constantly thinking that ahead. And I think by me having that already in my ingrained in my head and that work ethic on top of it, hey, I, I'm ready to go. And I think, yes, I'm still learning this job and this avenue, but it's constantly saying, okay, there's something that needs to be done. I, I feel like I have nothing, but there's something. Um, so I'm constantly always telling myself that um, day in and day out because, hey, something needs to be done in this moment. Yeah. I, I, and I love the the thinking and the visualizing. I, it takes me back to my baseball playing days and how between every pitch you're thinking about, okay, what, how many outs are there? How many base runners? What's the score? What happens if the ball gets hit here? And then, so you're thinking about all that, but you also need to know like, okay, if the ball gets hit to the right fielder and they don't field it cleanly and it goes by them, where do I have to rotate on field and everything? It's like, right. you literally have to, it's almost like defensive driving in, in some yeah. ways where, yeah. um, yeah, you have to be ready for for all those different ways. So uh, I think that's really cool. All right, let's move to the to the next phrase. Mm -hmm. It is this one's a, a little bit longer. Um, so take some time maybe to to elaborate a little bit longer on this one too. It is a deep trust. Somebody said that they have a deep trust in you in the in that you have a deep trust. Excuse me in the daily process and mm -hmm. what it takes to become a champion. And mm -hmm. I thought. Obviously, process and champion really stand out to me, but that whole phrase, deep trust and daily process of what it takes to become a champion. What does that phrase mean to you? Man, yeah, it's it's enjoying the ride and enjoying the process and trusting what you're doing and the, trusting those around you that are doing it with you. That's what I think of uh, because, yes, I want to be a champion right now in this very moment because I have that mentality of a championship mentality, but I know for us as a program at USD as a program to get to that point, we're gonna have to trust the trials and tribulations along the way. We're gonna have to trust that the, that speed bump was placed there for a reason. We're gonna have to trust that um, and then grow from it and learn from it. Um, so I, I, I love that because I constantly tell myself, enjoy the ride, enjoy the ride, enjoy the ride um, because it can, this game can beat you down. And I know in our first couple of games, we had two losses and I was constantly telling myself, where do I go next? Where do I go next? And wanting to find that next thing. But then I had to stop and say, trust it, trust the process, trust that it's going to get to where you want to be. Don't feel like you have to be something that you're not to get to that point. It's just, they, they trusted you for a reason. They wanted you the head coach for a reason. Um, and just going along with that. Um, yes, you may have to change a couple things in practice, but don't change who you are. Trust who you are and what you can bring to this program to get to that championship um, conference or championship mentality or whatever that looks like. But it's just trusting that. Trust is that. I love that word. Trust, man. <laughs> I, <laughs> it's everything and what you do. But that's what I kind of think of when I hear that statement. And that was very powerful, actually. Got me really <laughs> 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 well we are two peas in a pod with trust when i wrote my book culture of excellence that was by far like the best part to write about was the the whole trust section mm -hmm. and i also love how when you're talking about the process you're saying okay you right now today in this moment you have championship aspirations but 
whether or not you have championship aspirations, you literally cannot win the championship today in right. this moment. <laughs> so, right. um, so what, it, what I'd love to segue into, I, I just thought of this question when you were talking about that is the carrot of winning a championship can be a really powerful motivator, right? And you won a big 10 championship during your college days. It's not a national championship, obviously, but still a, a really great accomplishment from, from a team perspective. And then you were talking to me a little bit earlier about how by your senior season, things weren't going as well as maybe you had imagined. And I'm wondering, you know, from a, a process and a culture perspective, like when, because you've been in it now, when you reach one of those mountaintops, and again, it wasn't the highest of the high, but you won a championship. How do you stay motivated to mm -hmm. continue to want it as badly as you did before you got what you were trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. I think because you got to have a taste of that carrot. I think because you got to taste it and you're like, man, that tasted very good. I want to <laughs> taste that again. Yeah. And it is kind of striving for that. And then sometimes it may not happen because I know the following year we didn't win the Big Ten Championship. We got to go to regionals, but um, we didn't do so well there. But it's constantly tasting it. That taste is always going to be there. And I think once this team, once this program gets a taste of it, man, it's, it's not going to ever leave your mind. It's you want that. It's like your favorite candy. Like, you know, exactly what your favorite candy <laughs> tastes like. Yeah. And I want that every single time. Uh, and so it's just remembering that. I think that's, that's all I got to say about that. It's constantly like, Hey, I want that. I want that pizza pizza. Let me take a bite. Cause I want it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. That is so good. All right. So I have a few questions left before we let you go off to practice today. Uh, MJ, you are the first black female head coach of any program at USD athletics. Uh, and with that, you are, well, let, let's start there. Um, you know, just, just knowing that you are in, in some ways groundbreaking for that university. Uh, how does that make you feel? What do you feel when, when you hear that statement? Man, I, I smile every time because I, I, I can't believe it myself. Um, and I think it holds a lot. And I try to, you know, be that person that people are looking for me to be, especially with that whole title along with it. Um, but I, sometimes I find myself having that kind of overpower me a little bit and make me into something that I'm not. And it, I have to constantly remind myself, yes, this is groundbreaking. Yes, this is, you know, very pivotal time right now, but don't let this deter you from what you're trying to do for yourself, for the team, for others around you. And, um, it's, I know who I am and it's constantly reminding myself, be who you are. Uh, you don't have to be this stellar, you know, coach and all these things. This, this is your, you know, you're still in the beginning of your coaching career as a head coach. So don't try to be all these things in a short amount of time. It's just, hey, being you, you were hired for a reason and everything's going to just be there where it may, the chips may fall where they may. And the title is, it's great, but it's just a title. And I have to keep constantly reminding myself because I want to be so many things with that title. But I know if I do, I'm not going to be the most authentic self for my, for me, my coaching staff and for the team, especially. So I love the title and love all that it brings, but I have to keep myself, Hey, don't overanalyze the title because it's so easy to do that. Um, it's just staying with what I can do and being who I am. Yeah, absolutely. And with all of that, you are also the youngest active softball head coach at the division one level. And I'm not going to ask you how you feel about that. I'm sure there's a lot of similar feelings, but what I am curious about is just knowing that you're less removed from the game than many of your peers. Do you think that plays to your advantage, whether it's recruiting relatability with, you know, just, just knowing that, you know, you've gone through it. Um, whereas, you know, someone who maybe has been coaching for 30 years, that that's, that's a long time or even 10 years these days <laughs> feels, feels like an eternity. So um, do you feel like it's helped you in some way? being um, one of the, the well the youngest in this case but um, just being so so much closer in age to the girls than maybe some of your peers are yeah definitely I, I definitely agree because there's times where the girls came up to me not even about softball related things sometimes about their boyfriends or their ex, whatever if they need just someone to talk to or listen to and I think that's what's nice I think because I have that approachability because we are still close in age and I'm not that far removed Hey, they can come to me, both softball and personal things if they choose to. 
And then when it comes to the recruiting side, definitely it's been very impactful. I remember I've had like over a hundred of over an hour phone conversations with recruits because I understand the travel ball aspect. I know how demanding it is. And I know how it is when they see their friend get, you know, committed somewhere and they're still kind of filling things out and things like that. So I, I understand and I connecting with them, I think has been very positive. And I think by me understanding who they are and what they can bring and what they're going through in this moment has been very kind of powerful for me um, because I, I age is, it's, I think it's good. Age is good being that close to them uh, because they can come to me for anything and they're not afraid to say anything. They're still, they're choosing the words very wisely because, Hey, I'm still the head coach and right. they, you know, but uh, they do a very good job. I'm like, Hey coach, like, I just want to let you know. And they're just, they're just awesome. Very awesome. And uh, the age has been helpful in that regard. Sure. Sure. I mean, what seems like just a, a great situation, everything that we've talked about today. And then you throw on top of that, the beautiful San Diego weather. I mean, who wouldn't want to be a part of your program, right? right. Exactly. <laughs> Come on over. <laughs> Oh man. Well, if I could go back in time and, uh, you know, change the things about me, I guess, and everything, I would love to be a part of your program. Cause I, I think oh, the things that <laughs> I think I really do, I think the things that you're doing are, are great. Uh, and I, I think you're going to definitely make an impact here in the future as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I just appreciate so much you taking the time today, MJ, to talk to us. And we certainly wish you the best. Hope, fingers crossed, no COVID in interruptions, excuse me, and we, we get through the season. But certainly wish you the best. And thank you again for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you. I appreciate it. I really do.